let's talk about the food web. All organisms in the Great Lakes are connected, and examining the structure of the food web makes this connection more visible. While predator fish are vital to the Great Lakes fishery, just as important are the creatures at the bottom of the food web that sustain all other living things. These microscopic organisms are the foundation, or base, of what all other organisms in the lakes rely on for survival. Let's step back and start with the term food chain. A food chain is a simple way to show who eats whom in a given ecosystem. For example, in Lake Huron, a simple food chain may show green algae, eaten by mayfly nymphs, eaten by yellow perch, eaten by walleye. The word chain actually paints a really great image. Imagine a chain that helps to lift heavy materials. If even one piece of the chain breaks, the entire chain can't function properly. This is much like a food chain. All parts are connected. If one type of organism is eliminated or vastly reduced, especially one at the base or bottom, this affects all of the other organisms. Likewise, if we have too much of one type of organism, this may also affect the overall balance and can have negative impacts on the other organisms in the food chain. In a system as large as a Great Lake, Simple food chains cannot fully describe the relationship among organisms that feed on each other. Fish do not usually eat just one food source. Rather, they feed on multiple species, making things much more complex. So, instead of a simple chain, we can start thinking about a more complex set of connections, like a web. For the rest of the video, the term I will use is food web. A food web can be shown in different ways. Later, I will show several neat fact sheets depicting the specific food webs of each of the Great Lakes, as well as Lake St. Clair. But to first get more background information, let's build a model and talk about key terminology from the food web world. This model is going to represent what is known as a trophic pyramid, which shows the transfer of food, or in other words, energy, through an ecosystem. Each layer we look at is called a trophic level. The base, or foundation, of the pyramid represents the bottom, or foundation, of the food web and is made up of primary producers, namely phytoplankton, such as green algae. These are microscopic plants capable of making their own food resources from the sun's energy. Next are the different levels of consumers. Zooplankton, microscopic animals that float in the water, and some macroinvertebrates that feed on the primary producers are considered primary consumers. You can also think of them as herbivores. Next come secondary consumers, which includes forage fish and some macroinvertebrates like insect nymphs that feed on the zooplankton. These organisms would be the first level of carnivores. Or if they eat a mix of primary producers and primary consumers, then they are omnivores. Some forage fish examples in the Great Lakes include cisco, yellow perch, alewife, and smelt, the last two being invasive species. Forage fish are also known as prey fish. The top of the model represents the top predators, or tertiary consumers, that feed on the prey fish. Examples in the Great Lakes include lake trout, salmon, smallmouth bass, muskie, and walleye. While there can be additional consumer levels and some overlap among the levels depending on the ecosystem, the pyramid shape is not by coincidence. Rather, it serves to show that both the amount of energy available and number of organisms decreases at each level. So, to say it simply, you need an awful lot of the small stuff, which is the phytoplankton and other primary producers, in order to have a decent population of the big stuff, which is the top predators. Without the base of the pyramid, you can't have the top. Let's take a look now at what the food webs look like for the five Great Lakes and Lake St. Clair, courtesy of the NOAA Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory, Michigan Sea Grant, and the GLFC. To find these online, simply search NOAA Glural Food Web Diagrams. This is the food web for Lake Ontario. 
Lake Erie. Lake St. Clair. Lake Huron. Lake Michigan. And finally, Lake Superior. Did you notice the similarities between the food webs, including the sea lamprey in the top left corner of each diagram? One other important point to note is that each food web was only showing the dominant species for each lake, not all species present. To talk more specifically about Great Lakes food webs and how invasive species have influenced them over the years, I have invited my colleague, fellow communications associate with the GLFC, Dr. Andrea Meals, to join us. Prior to working for the GLFC, Andrea completed her master's and doctoral degrees at Michigan State University in cooperation with NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab. During that time, she spent many years examining some of the smallest creatures in the Great Lakes, both native and invasive. Hi Andrea, I'm so glad you are joining me for this video today. Hi Lauren, I'm excited to be here to talk about such an important topic. Yes it is. Though you work with a top predator invasive species now, the sea lamprey, your background involves studying some of the smaller invasive species, correct? That's right. Invasive species are one of the greatest threats facing the Great Lakes. My work, and the work of many others, has shown that even the smallest invaders can have big impacts on Great Lakes food webs. Since the 1980s, the Great Lakes have experienced wave after wave of lower trophic level invasive species, such as zebra and quagga mussels, spiny water fleas, fish hook water fleas, and multiple others. Time has shown that these lower trophic level invaders are capable of disrupting the entire food web. Take zebra and quagga mussels, for example. These small mussels feed vigorously on phytoplankton. Consumption by the mussels has been so intense that they have noticeably cleared the water in the Great Lakes. Now note that I said cleared, not cleaned the water. Clear water is not the same as healthy, clean water. The water has cleared because phytoplankton are much less abundant now. Unfortunately, less phytoplankton means less food for zooplankton and other primary consumers, which in turn means less food for prey fish and ultimately predator fish. Thank you for that insight. Could you now tell us a little more about the research you did for your graduate degrees, as I believe it relates quite closely to this topic? Absolutely. I spent almost 10 years researching how zebra mussels and spiny water fleas, also known by their scientific name, Bithotrephes, affect Great Lakes food webs. One of my projects involved using network analysis to quantify how zebra mussels have affected energy flow to about 80 Great Lakes species and life stages. The results of that work were astounding. My collaborators and I found that zebra mussel invasion affected almost every single organism in the food webs we studied to varying degrees. My work on spiny water fleas investigated evolutionary change in their tail spine length and how food web interactions affect traits of invasive species and in turn how invasive species traits affect food web interactions. That research also showed how tightly linked organisms are in the Great Lakes food web. Thank you for sharing that. At this point, I hope all of our viewers have an understanding of why a healthy food web, particularly among the lower levels, is so important to the health of the Great Lakes fishery. For a final question, I was hoping you could explain how and why researchers regularly monitor the Great Lakes food webs. Who benefits from this knowledge? Sure, just learning about the food web at one given moment in time does not tell the whole story. Ecosystems and food webs can change over time, so it is important for researchers to stay up to date. Fishery resource managers also need to stay aware because changes in the food web affect fisheries and the health of the Great Lakes. Through a process facilitated by the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, research findings are regularly conveyed to fishery managers so that they may make scientifically informed management decisions that consider the whole food web, not just certain fish, such as those at the top. 
One of the agencies that surveys Great Lakes food webs is the U.S. Geological Survey through their Large Vessel Program. A variety of surveys are conducted over the course of the year in each of the five Great Lakes. Prey fish and predator fish surveys, which may include analysis of gut contents, are conducted as well as macroinvertebrate surveys, zooplankton sampling, and some work assessing primary production. Some of the surveys have been in place since the 1970s, allowing for a clearer picture of Great Lakes food webs over an extended period of time, which is critical information for fishery managers. This has been great information. Thanks so much for being here with us today, Andrea.